Welcome to the Damcasters. I'm your host, Matt Bone. On the 23rd of April, 2022, the Experimental Aircraft Association's Aviation Museum in Oshkosh unveiled a new exhibit with a Transvaught F4U-4 Corsair that, following much research, was found to be one of the mounts of Medal of Honor recipient Thomas Hudner Jr. Joining us on the podcast today is Chris Henry. Chris is the Museum Programs Coordinator at EAA and was part of the team that researched the history of their Corsair and found out it linked to an incredible friendship between two wingmen, Thomas Hudner Jr. and Jesse L. Brown, the United States Navy's first African-American naval aviator, their story being intertwined until the 4th of December 1950, which is the subject of the upcoming film, Devotion, starring Jonathan Majors and Glenn Powell, which is based on the book by Adam Makos. But before we get to Jesse and Tom's story, I have to ask the question I've been asking all of my guests who were able to attend AirVenture at Oshkosh this year. How was it, especially for the team at EAA? Oh, it was, uh, it was great. We actually had a pretty record turnout. I want to say we were upwards of 650,000 attendees. Wow. Uh, and that's, you know, in the week. Uh, that spanned the week. We had over 10,000 airplanes. And, you know, the nice thing that we have is we have so much room that, you know, even when, you know, even during more trying times, um, you know, you never feel like you're right on top of people, you know, I mean, maybe a few events here and there we had to tweak, but for the most part, if you want to go watch the air show, you just go sit on a flight line, spread out and watch the air show and you don't really feel crowded. Um, but, uh, it was great, great turnout, uh, lots of families here, you know, and, and this year, I think everybody felt a little bit more comfortable getting back into some of those, uh, normal functions that maybe we had held off on a few years ago. So most people will know about the air show, air venture, all that, but on the museum side, do you want to just give, give us the elevator pitch for, for why we should visit the museum? Cause that's what we're going to be talking about today. Absolutely. It's one of the most hidden gems of Oshkosh. I always tell everybody because during the air show, of course you want to get here, you want to get down on the ground, you want to see everything that's flying. Uh, but in our museum, we have around 200 to 250 additional aircraft on display in the museum. And it, uh, it varies from, you know, replica, the first flight uh, with, the, you know, right fire replica, all the way through to some warbirds. Uh, we have golden age aircraft. So we have a, a pretty massive uh, collection. And then, of course, we have great exhibits. Like we have uh, exhibits with Frank Borman's personal collection from uh, Gemini and Apollo 8. Mm -hmm. We have Joe Engel and Jeannie Engel's collection, uh, which is basically the X-15 all the way through to the shuttle. Uh, so, and there's items that literally went into space or, you know, my favorite, one of my favorite items in there is uh, Joe Engel's handwritten notes while he was uh, flying the shuttle on reentry. Uh, he's the only person to ever hand fly the shuttle. Uh, manually through reentry, and they're his notes he wrote on his kneeboard while he was flying, and uh, we have those on display in the museum. So, oh, that's uh, amazing! Really awesome. So, yeah, yeah, it's it, it the place is a uh, just some hidden treasures that are are truly that. I mean, they are they are American history treasures. Yeah, I've got to do one of these about Joe because his career is oh. just it's extraordinary. It's it, it's like the yeah. the bucket list of all bucket lists of uh, things that you. would You'd want to oh, you'd yeah. want to fly and have a go at. I, and I challenge anybody to go find a picture of Joe where he's not smiling. I mean, the guy is just <laughs> such a nice guy. He's always happy, and uh, uh, and his wife Jeannie also had a career at NASA. Mm. Uh, she was a chief knowledge information officer. Um, just uh, a, amazing couple. So we're going to be talking Corsairs today mm -hmm. uh, yeah. because of a project that you've been involved on, and one that is, I suppose going to be hitting the news even even harder than the announcement back in April with the uh, with the film coming up. We're going to come up to that later, but we do have to say, ladies and gentlemen, if you are excited for Devotion with Jonathan Majors and the guy from Top Gun, and you don't know the story, you might want to hold off on listening to the rest of this, because we will be telling Jesse Brown and, and Tom Hudner's story end to end here um, and not just about Tom's airplane. So 
There you go. You've been warned. <laughs> Because um, it, spoilers, if you want to turn off now, <laughs> yeah, exactly. So that, yeah, we're giving everybody a minute to, to hit pause and then go away. But anyways, let's let's start talking about uh, the aircraft in, in the first place because the Corsair had a, a fascinating career, didn't it? It was um, all over the place, flew with everybody, had a bit of a troubled entry. But what's the story? I really firmly believe it's one of the premier aircraft of World War II. I would say, uh, especially from the Americans, uh, I would I would put it up there with airplanes like the the Spitfire and the Hurricane, as far as uh, those legendary airframes that you're going to hear about a hundred years from now. Still, I think it flew into everybody's living room when uh, Robert Conrad uh, starred in a TV show called Black Sheep Squadron in the seventies. Great show. I think that's how. Yeah, it was. It was a great <laughs> show. You know, it took some liberties with history, but. But to be honest, it inspired a lot of people to get interested in the Corsair and in Pappy Boynton. And, you know, I'm a happy guy anytime you see our veterans getting attention, uh, even if it's not always historically accurate uh, telling of the story that, you know, to at least honor of them uh, correctly is, uh, is, is fantastic. So, you know, at least it's getting younger generations into the history, you know. So the... Corsair, of course, developed in 1940, uh, I think I think is when the first uh, flight happened, uh, had a huge engine, uh, big prop. I think it was the biggest prop that was swung on a carrier deck during World War II. Uh, had the gall wings, of course, uh, to, to help uh, get the landing gear where they needed the landing gear to make sure it was rugged. They did have some problems early on with uh, flying off the carrier. It could there, there's, there's a couple different sources, um, but basically... For a long time, the, uh, the the theory was that the Royal Air Force got them and then sort of showed the Americans how to land. Um, what we're kind of finding out now is there there may have been some truth in copying, but um, the United States actually had them deployed uh, on their way out uh, while before the Royal Air Force had them. They were deployed in May, and the Royal Air Force, I think, got theirs in August, Royal Navy, I guess. And what happened was as they were leaving the United States, they got stopped. And they said, it's a supply chain issue. We don't have enough supply parts to keep a squadron of Corsairs going. Uh, so they told the squadron, you either have to transition to the Hellcat, the F-6F Hellcat, or you're going to become a land-based Navy unit. And that's exactly what the guys did. They opted to stay with the airplane, and they became a land-based unit. And uh, they then uh, um, replaced the carrier group with Hellcats. Mm -hmm. Eventually, the Corsair figure out its way. Uh, you, they really do use a, uh, a method very similar to what the Royal uh, Navy did with, with the uh, approach to the carrier deck. Um, but uh, Airplane went on to become just world famous. Became hugely famous uh, because of their exploits in VMF-214, the Black Sheep. To this day, they still uh, hold a record for uh, the best kill ratio in Marine Corps aviation history. I think it was 11 to 1. Uh, they had a very colorful leader, Pappy Boynton. Um, but again, uh, the airplane served everywhere throughout the Pacific. And uh, it's just a thing of legend. I mean, movies like Flying Leatherneck with John Wayne uh, also helped uh, cement it into our image, I think. And uh, But it just it's, it's the Navy's answer to the P-51 Mustang, if you will. I mean, you know, for the Army Air Force guys, the Mustang was the epitome of cool. And I think the Corsair is that as well. And uh, the airplane was so good that even at the end of World War II, when they were scrapping a lot of other airplanes, the Navy and Marines were saying, you know, I think we're going to need this airplane. So they actually put them into active storage. Uh, they were not just scrapped. So that was uh, kind of a telling sign that they had a true winner from, from it. Um, the airplane was so widely needed that uh, three companies produced them. Chance Vought, Brewster, and Goodyear, uh, all three uh, produced the Corsair, some in larger numbers than others, but uh, still just an amazing airplane and one that during the Korean War really found its way. Uh, when we we're talking about the need for jets to go faster, uh, the Corsair was sort of hanging back and doing things like close air support, uh, an airplane uh, that was very suited for that. Later, you know, something like the Sky Raider would, would take its role, but... Uh, during the early parts of Korea, it was the Corsair. It's just such a fascinating aircraft and the story through it. And I'd highly recommend an, anyone to go, especially to look at the, the, Mar the Marines on Guadalcanal with, with the Corsairs and, and the, the ace race that they had there. That is just, 
ex- extraordinary and just shows when they made the step up from the Wildcat to the Corsair, that sort of doubling of their ability to um, take the fight to the, the Japanese in, in that highly contested airspace. They they, oh, they, yeah. they they liked it. It was a target-rich environment, wasn't it? Yeah, um, yep, exactly. But we're talking about Korea, and we're going to focus in on a specific unit today, which is VF-32. Now, for my European listeners, the nomenclature for military <laughs> units in, in, in the US is a bit strange. What does VF stand for? So it actually stood for a, a Navy Carrier Group Fighter Squadron. That's what that stands for. And then 32 is it was assigned to the USS Leyte. Um, so that was that was how they did it in the Navy uh, here. And uh, and that's the unit we're talking about. They they would, uh, you know, when I talk about like VMF 214, that's a Marine squad, squadron. So when you talk about the Black Sheep Squadron, that, that M stands for Marines. Uh, but that's what it is, yeah. It's so much more difficult than just three squadron and yeah, six or yeah. nine. <laughs> yeah, I know. I know it is. It is. But I think the Air Force got it right with just numbering a squadron. So, <laughs> so we have a couple really fascinating gentlemen that we're going to be talk, talking about. The, the story sort of, especially with your aircraft, is 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 linked to, to one of them. But um, we've got Jesse L. Brown, who is – a remarkable man in, in his own right. Um, and he, he joins VF 32 and there is something about him. That's a little bit different. Absolutely. Jesse Brown was this country's first African-American naval aviator. Um, so you got to understand you're talking the late 1940s when he's attending uh, flight school. Uh, as a matter of fact, the first day when he was a cadet and everybody is walking in, the instructors would sit up on a uh, um, sort of a higher level than the rest of everybody, look down on the hangar floor, watching all the cadets walk in, and they would try to actually pick which cadets they wanted. And there were people that were basically saying they would not teach Jesse to fly. One gentleman um, said, you know, I, I will teach him and, uh, and, and took him on and took him on as an instructor. Uh, you know, instructor student, and uh, they actually stayed lifelong friends uh, until the end, which we'll talk about. There is a lot of you know interesting debate. There's there's that the the fantastic U.S. Soldier Project, which has looked into the the questionnaires that have been sent out, which is shining a whole new light on this. And it's from from a sort of outside view, you kind of think by the fifties, by Korea, things are better. But he really is you know, a, a unique individual. And, and that means he has to do more than, than his contemporaries in this, doesn't he? Absolutely. And, you know, something that always um, shocked me is when you, when you think of like our Tuskegee Airmen, you know, the African-American squadron flew in World War Two. you know, and then they, they come home and in, and in my opinion, you know, they prove themselves. However, they come home to a peacetime military and they have to keep proving themselves. Uh, I believe in 1947 or 49, they won the, uh, the Air Force's Top Gun Trophy flying P-47s. Um, so the fight still continued uh, for a long way, uh, for a long time. And yes, Jesse, uh, Jesse had an uphill battle. As a matter of fact, um, uh, Jesse had a few bumps on the road as training. Who hasn't? You know, I mean, that's just mm-hmm. normal learning to fly. But Jesse's instructor felt he was a, a really good pilot and he was going to do great. Jesse's instructor went on leave and another instructor flew at Jesse. This instructor tried to purposely wash Jesse out, uh, actually w- took it to a review board. His initial instructor, the guy that said I would take him on, came back from leave, basically stormed into this, this session and demanded that it stop. And they said, well, here's Jesse. You can have Jesse back and continue to teach him to fly, which he did. So, um, yeah. He really had to. Uh, he had to fight harder than than a lot of other people. But he makes it through, and you know he he becomes a naval aviator because you don't have pilots in the in the navy, do you? That's right. That's <laughs> right. They say they're better than pilots. So, <laughs> and yeah, and anyone who's watched Top Guns got got that one down. And it's <laughs> you know this is this is highly specialized. You know the the great line of landing a bird on a postage stamp. You know it's it's incredible because the. I suppose before we get on to Tom, the other character in this is the USS Lady herself. She's, you know, 
she's she's an old she's an old ship by this point isn't she she's she's been about yeah absolutely it's been about uh it came around the end of world war ii um and then yeah it has been around i mean so it's a, it's a world war ii era aircraft carrier and they're flying world war ii era aircraft as a matter of fact when jesse first gets into fighters uh he didn't trans start into the corsair he actually started in the f8f bearcat uh that was the airplane that vf32 was flying first uh they then later transitioned to uh, the corsair which really was thought of as uh kind of a more demanding airplane i mean it was it was no joke when he went to the Corsair. It was you got to do your homework. It'll it'll have you for lunch. You know, which which is seems counterintuitive because the the Bearcat is a later aircraft. It's yeah. I've always thought it's oddly proportioned because it's kind of got those those stubby stubby wings, hasn't it, with the the big engine and it's like somebody made an air racer into a fighter. Is what it yeah. looks like. I mean, it, <laughs> yeah, yeah. It looks like the combination of a Navy fighter and like a GB racer or something like that. So. Sounds fantastic when you see it fly, though. It, it, it's yeah, it, it's amazing. But yeah, we're not going to talk about that one. That, that's a different show. <laughs> let's um, let's jump on to to Tom. So Thomas H. Hudner Jr. Um, what's what's his story? Because these two are going to be pretty inseparable for the next part of our conversation. Absolutely, and it, they're complete opposites. You know, Jesse was born in a poor family in Mississippi. Uh, Tom was born to a very well-off family and in, uh, um, geez, I'm trying to remember the, uh, Falls River, Massachusetts. They actually, uh, he, he missed out on going into World War II. He really felt bad about not getting a chance to do his duty. Uh, and when Korea came out, he was actually a point that he had an appointment to go to an Ivy League school. He turned it down to go to flight training and, uh, actually not flight training, went to the Navy. Uh, and first he had uh, ground or ship based uh, duty. And then he, uh, at the urging of some friends, uh, tried out for uh, flight training and he got a slot for flight training. Um, so again, totally different, you know, uh, Jesse African-American came from a poor family in Mississippi in the South. Tom, uh, came from a you know, white, well-off family. And, um, so under normal circumstances, these guys probably would not hang out if they saw each other on the street, but that common denominator of going into the military, going in to fight for what you believe in, uh, I think, uh, sort of put all that other side, all that other stuff aside. And then they became, uh, they became friends together. It's interesting how those, how those bonds are made, especially in wartime, but you, you've got in our notes, you've, you, you cryptically have cruise to France. Yes, down yeah. and that I, I'm I'm intrigued because I, I I don't know this part of the story. So what what happened there? Absolutely. So the Leyte. Um, so basically, Tom joins the squadron. He joins VF32 as a replacement pilot. Jesse was there first, and while he's getting shown around, uh, he meets people like uh, Marty Good, Dick Savoli, Dad Fowler, um, and he is yeah Wilkie Wilkinson, and, and by all these guys. You know, they're all treating him pretty good, but they also let him know right off the bat that Jesse is one of our pilots. He's one of us. And if it bothers you that he's a person of color, then you need to transfer out of the squadron. And it didn't bother Tom. Tom really didn't have a say in it. He didn't even know he was there. He hadn't met Jesse yet. Uh, but he joins the squadron, and then uh, the squadron does their first cruise to go to France. Now, what was interesting about this is peacetime. This, this was prior to the involvement in Korea. The pi- a lot of the pilots had their wives fly into France. They were going to Canes, I believe. And they said, hey, we're going to be docked there for a while. Like, we can actually hang out, have uh, dinners and stuff together, and enjoy France uh, on shore leave, things like that, um, before they deployed elsewhere. So when they go to France, um, of all things, Elizabeth Taylor is there on her honeymoon. And um, her first husband... He is um, already sort of being involved in other relationships, if you will. And they're there on their honeymoon. Uh, Very and, diplomatically put, sir. Well done. Yes, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> um, and the wives all notice this. And she's been very friendly to them. Uh, so the wives basically take Elizabeth Taylor under the wing and she hangs out with them in France. Um, and there's actually pictures at one point uh, they gave her a tour of the ship. And there's pictures of Elizabeth Taylor on the USS Leyte uh, looking at one of the Corsairs, checking out a helicopter, 
Um, pretty cool stuff. So um, she got to meet Jesse, hung out with Jesse. It was um, it was unique. I mean, that was an interesting uh, trip. But that that is my favorite part of that story, um, and it ties into something that happens later. And I'll uh, I'll, t- I'll divulge a bit more of that later. But uh, just kind of a neat start to the adventure. Yeah, Conrad Hilton was not a, a, a nice chap. Um, yes, I think is yes. is a is a, is a p- polite way of putting it. But we're <laughs> gonna we're gonna ignore him because he doesn't deserve yeah. any more airtime. Yeah. So, when do they hear about getting deployed to Korea? Because they they so are on the wrong side of the planet. Exactly. Um, they actually came back uh, from France, I believe. Went back there one more time, and then from there they got deployed. And started to, to sail that direction. It's, it's the fall of 1950. Uh, and that's when they started heading toward, uh, toward Korea. And uh, keep in mind, while they're doing this, Korea experiences the worst winter they had had in, like, centuries. Uh, I mean, it was a horrible winter, uh, record-setting for, for bad snow and, and cold and wind. Um, so this is all happening. You can actually Google if one of my favorite pictures is they tied some boards to a tug, uh, or to a jeep, I think, and it's on the deck of, of the of an aircraft carrier, and they're using it as a snow plow. They're trying to plow the snow off the aircraft carrier deck, so it looked rough. There was no place in Korea that looked very inviting during the winter, so it all <laughs> looks so cold. It's, it's it's an interesting, you know. I, I find I find Korea fascinating because it's it's this bridge moment, you know. In aviation, we kind of think of the Second World War as, as this moment where there's the the, the great leap forward. Mm-hmm. But in, yeah. in in my my mind, Korea is actually really that moment because that is the transition between what you could call traditional aviation and what we would recognize now as aviation with jet aircraft and everything being higher, faster, and a little bit more complex. But you've you've got this moment where you've got the space age stuff. You've got your 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 sabers and your your MiG fifteens coming up, but you're still fighting the same way that you all you always have. And in the middle of this, you have this entire class of aircraft, whether it be Sea Furies, Corsairs, the the lot that are basically aircraft out of time, fighting a war that was still very familiar to everybody that was fighting it. Well, you know, and you made a good point there. The aircraft, um, if you think about it, the Corsair was fighting alongside America's first naval jets and the Sky Raider, which the Sky Raider, I mean, that soldiered on all till the end of Vietnam. I mean, so, um, you know, that's another uh, thing to think about. The men who fought World War II in many places were still fighting Korea. Uh, many of the guys in VF-32 um, have uh, air medals for bombing Japanese aircraft carriers in World War II or shooting down, you know, uh, Japanese aircraft in the Pacific. So, so yeah, the aircraft are, are definitely holdovers from World War II and transitioning to Korea. And I would argue that so is, uh, so are the, the, the soldiers fighting it, you know, still a lot of them were World War II. And then the ones who came in earlier, a lot of them, I mean, that's where our pool of, uh, America's first astronauts came from, or a lot of Naval aviators that flew in Korea, same with the Air Force. So, so when Jesse and Tom get out there, what are the sort of operations they're flying? Because you know they 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 are a fighter squadron, but they are not going to be engaged exactly. in, in those sort of um, those sort of sources. Exactly. What what are they what are they doing? When you hear uh, fighting uh, corsairs and fighting, you think of dog fighting and things like that. These guys were doing a couple different things. One was. Uh, for lack of a better term, bomber escort. They would escort the Sky Raiders uh, in to hit dams, bridges, things like that. Uh, but more than anything, the Corsairs were doing close air support with uh, the Army soldiers and Marine Corps soldiers on the ground, uh, fight, you know, helping do whatever they can uh, to provide them air cover. Uh, so they were flying with bombs, rockets, um, and then, of course, you know, their machine guns that they had on uh, on the aircraft. So uh, that was kind of the standard layout or weapon, but that's what they were doing, close air support, helping the guys on the ground. And how many, before we get to the um, the 4th of December, 1950, how how long had they been in theater flying, flying ops? Uh, I want to say it was about two months. Mm. Um, I'm guessing, I'm not looking at a reference at this point, but I think they were there for a couple months. I know that uh, Jesse had flown 27 combat missions, um, which is a pretty, it's an intense a period number. Mm. Yeah. 
And I know the fighting was pretty intact or intense. Um, you know, a couple missions, they'd come back with bullet holes, things like that in the aircraft. I mean, so you're, you're getting down there fighting the, uh, you know, fighting the enemy. So let's, let's get to it. What happened on the 4th of December, 1950? So December 4th, 1950, uh, they were taken off for a mission to provide close air support, uh, near the Chosin Reservoir. Uh, they called that the Frozen Chosen, and then uh, just intense fighting uh, for our land-based units there. It was uh, Jesse and Tom flying a wing for each other. I believe Wilkinson, Marty Good, uh, and some of the others were, were involved in the flight as well. And uh, they went over, uh, they hit their target, fired their rockets, and when they were coming out, uh, they noticed that Jesse was trailing uh, some sort of a vapor. And it was light smoke. They couldn't tell if it was fuel or oil, uh, but he was definitely trailing something. Uh, Jesse didn't even notice at first. He said the airplane was handling fine, uh, but then he started to lose uh, engine performance, uh, and eventually the aircraft, uh, the engine completely gave out. Uh, so Jesse knew that he was going to have to make a, a dead stick landing. Now, keep in mind, they're surrounded by the enemy. I mean, they were just in there fighting the enemy, and they were trying to get out of there. Uh, it's toward the end of the day, you know, so you're getting toward the end of daylight. So Jesse um, knows he's got to make a dead stick landing. He's surrounded by the enemy. I mean, they had been fighting, uh, you know, to get in there, help the people on the ground to get out. Nighttime is uh, on the horizon. You know, it's later in the day. Uh, so Jesse crash lands his airplane pretty hard. We have a Timeless Voices interview, oral history with Tom Hudner from years ago. And Tom said that it was a pretty hard impact. Um, slid to a stop. They circled the crash site, waiting to see what was going to happen, if he was still alive. Canopy rolled back, and Jesse was moving, so they knew he was alive. At that point, the flight lead climbs so he can get better radio coverage, flips the channel to the carrier station to basically let the, the helicopter, the rescue helicopter, know that, hey, we need, we need help. Tom can see the fire has started. Uh, on the, under the engine of the airplane. And Jesse, while he's okay, he's not getting out of the airplane. Uh, so that was concerning to them. He was waving his hands and stuff, but he had not gotten out of the cockpit. It then dawned on them that Jesse was probably stuck in the cockpit. Um, now think about this. You're far from home. You're surrounded by the enemy. It's getting later in the day. Time to go home, right? Tom Hudner keys his mic and simply just says, I'm going in and made one low approach first to see what the conditions were like on the second approach. He belly landed his good airplane next to Jesse slid to a stop about 50 yards away from him, got out of the airplane and jumped off the wing into the snow and realized that he's in about waist deep snow. And it's uh it's about 13 degrees. And he uh, fought his way for those 50 yards to that airplane put out the fire with the snow goes to check on Jesse and Jesse is alert and everything. And, but he's stuck in the airplane when he hit, uh, everything basically instrument panel forward bent to the right. And when it did that, it pinched down on that right side and it trapped his, his leg, uh, in the cockpit. So they knew they were going to have to get some help. Uh, they were trying to get him out. They couldn't, uh, they then determined they needed a crash axe, which the helicopter uh, had to, it started to depart the aircraft carrier. It went back, got the crash axe, and then continued forward. And they said it's going to be about a half hour. So the enemy's closing in on them. They know there's a Corsair down there. Tom's doing everything he can to try and get him out. He's talking to Jesse to keep the spirits alive. Tom takes his own hat and gloves off and puts them on Jesse, who didn't have a hat and gloves. Jesse took his helmet off and threw it out, then started to try to get out of the airplane, thinking, I'm going to get out. But he couldn't. So now he had lost his gloves and hat. Uh, Tom removed his own gloves and hat and put them on Jesse, uh, wrapped him in a scarf, and um, worked to keep his spirits up, make sure the fire was out. Helicopter, they're an overlooked hero in this story. Because you have to understand, helicopters in the American military were in their infancy at this point. I mean, they looked kind of like what you're used to seeing on MASH or something like that. And this helicopter had a three-man crew. This helicopter pilot, knowing that there were two Corsairs down, drops his crew off at like a MASH unit 
and then continues to fly over enemy territory to get to them by himself near the end of the day, which helicopters couldn't fly at night at this time. So that's a brave pilot there as well in the story that, that kind of gets overlooked. But he gets there, um, and with an axe, they're trying to cut uh, the aircraft away from Jesse. Uh, and Jesse, they don't know if it was hypothermia or he had internal injuries, but he started to, to fade. And then um, he had told him, Tom, at one point, tell Daisy I love her. And that was the last thing he ever verbally said to anybody. They knew they couldn't get him out. Dark was almost there, and the enemy was closing in, uh, so they had to leave. Uh, That's something that bothered Tom very much. And his last words to Jesse were, I I will be back for you. Um, They got in the helicopter. Tom, pretty much a wreck, uh, having to leave Jesse. And uh, they got out of there right before nightfall. Weather then closed in on uh, on that area, so they couldn't launch any sort of rescue effort. they knew Jesse was deceased at that point uh, before they actually left that night. Uh, so it was about a day or two later when the weather cleared enough, they actually came in and they napalmed uh, the crash site so that Jesse wouldn't fall into the hands of the enemy. One of his fellow squatter mates uh, read the uh, the Lord's Prayer over the radio while they did it. When they got back to the United States, a uh, short time later, Jesse, his widow, Daisy, with the President of the United States, awards Tom Hudner the Medal of Honor. And in the meantime, Tom gets to tell Daisy the true events of what had happened there, which Daisy thought he was by himself and that possibly he had burned, which was an awful uh, outcome for, mm-hmm. for an aviator. And Tom was able to tell her that, no, that none of that happened and that you were on his mind the last minute. And uh, so uh, that helped ease her pain as well, knowing that it was a you know different, but Something that I always tell people to to think about. In this instance, you had two men risking their lives for one another in Korea, you know, under extreme uh, combat conditions. In the United States at that same time, they couldn't have a drink together. Uh, That's, we were still segregated pretty heavily here. And that's just mind blowing. And that's, that's what I, I was just, I just came from a Vietnam helicopter reunion last weekend. And while I was there, you know, in the photos, there's there's people of all races, of all nationalities. And I asked them about that, and they said, it didn't matter. You were here with us in this helicopter. You're risking your life. We're brothers. And that's how they looked at it. And here they are, 50 years later, they still look at it that way. So so that's, that's the story uh, uh, of what happened during Korea and with our first uh, African-American naval aviator, who is a true hero, as well as Tom and the rest of VF-32. Hmm. It's a heroic and tragic story, isn't it? It's it, it is, yeah. And the the thing that sort of has always run around my head here is, you know, Tom Tom comes home. There's the Medal of Honor ceremony. He he sees Daisy. Then he goes back, more or less, isn't it? Is it? Yeah. Is it? Yeah, yeah. It's it's not it's not long. He doesn't get long at home after going through that to be back with his unit and, and carrying on the fight. Goes back to VF-32 and uh, gets another aircraft. Something that uh, we'll talk about here uh, is that uh, how that all went. And uh, mm-hmm. But uh, VF-32 only lost two airplanes on that cruise. Uh, and that was Jesse's Corsair and Tom's Corsair. So they had to get uh, a replacement airplane or t- well, two replacement planes for, for those lost. And that's a little, not given too much away, but that's where our airplane kind of comes into the story. We're just going to take a short break for a quick message from our friends. Hello there, I'm Matthew Moss from Fighting on Film, the podcast for war movie fans. From the beaches of Normandy to the days of chivalry and swords, if it's been captured on film, we aim to cover it. Featuring top guests from the world of entertainment, historians and industry insiders, we bring you a unique look at the films from our favourite genre. Listen wherever you find your podcasts or find us at fightingonfilm.com. And we're back with Chris Henry discussing Jesse L. Brown, Tom Hudner Jr. and the Tom Hudner Jr. Corsair. So let's talk about your airplane. Absolutely. Our Corsair was a F4U-4. Bureau number was 97259. And it was built right at the tail end of the war. Uh, but didn't get involved in any combat uh, during World War II. 
it then kind of just went just into- to interrupt to say if anyone's curious, we're not going to be explaining the the chance font numbering and lettering system. Yeah. <laughs> we will be that's here a, forever. <laughs> that's a whole. That's five more shows. <laughs> but uh, the F four U dash four that we have, we knew it served in the Navy, and it's one of those funny in- stories where this every museum has stories about their artifacts where it's like oh i heard that was someone's or i heard it it was in war you know and you don't know sometimes if that's true or not you know and and of course our corsair was one of those uh what we do know is post-war it was purchased and it was the first corsair to race at reno at the reno air races luckily it was never modified it was just run stock raced two years there then was bought by a private individual who had it repainted and back into like a Navy paint job. Uh, and then eventually sold to Connie Edwards uh, and he donated it to us. That's what we knew for fact. The story floating around was that it had flown off the USS Boxer during Korea is the story we'd heard. And the museum curator, Ben uh, and myself, we were prepping for a webinar and we were going to do a webinar on the Corsair. And we said, well, we better let's find out about the Boxer. If this was ever real. Uh, so we start diving into the aircraft records <clears throat> and he, uh, I remember we're sitting together looking at the logbook, and he kind of flips one of the pages. And I remember the entry where it just said Fazron two, which was a, a fleet replacement squadron to VF 32. And I'm just sitting there and I'm like, wow, that's VF 32. That's, that's that squadron that Jesse and Tom were in. And we looked at the date and it was somewhere around like, I want to say like, like February of 1951. And I was like, oh, well that's, you know, it wasn't there during all this, you know? And then we started looking at the history and it was, you know, picked up from this replacement squadron by Marty Good. And we're like, wow, look at that, you know, flown back to their base and then flown by Tom Hudner, Fowler, uh, Wilkie Wilkinson, you know, all of these uh, Savoli, Dick Savoli, and uh, these legends that if you've read the book or in, in see the movie coming out soon, that, that you know, these names are, are characters in this. You know, they were Jesse's friends. So at that point, we realized that our airplane, uh, which was currently painted in a, in a Navy scheme from World War II, uh, which had nothing to do with its history, had a real history in Korea as a VF-32 airplane flown by someone who had received the Medal of Honor. And I'll tell you a fun story. When the airplane was restored the first time um, here at EAA, I shouldn't say the first time, but uh, the most recent time, John Hopkins, who is our chief of restoration, he was very proud of the restoration he did on that course there. It was beautiful. Uh, he matched the colors right. The markings were right where they should be. All the colors were were federal standard color numbers. He actually had the aircraft painted in lacquer paint. Uh, I mean, it was beautiful, and it was one. And this was done in the '90s. So, in the Warbird world, paint restoration in the '90s wasn't always the most it, accurate. It was a different time. Yeah, and and ours was ours was done really right, and so. You know, it sat there on display that way, but he was very proud of it. And when we found this out, that we found out that our airplane, um, you know, should be wearing a post-war scheme, a Korea scheme, it should have a white K on the tail and uh, and a big white number on the cowling. You know, we found out what number it was, 209. Uh, we had to kind of hat in hand go to John and we're like, John, we know this is your baby, <laughs> but we, we kind of have to tweak your baby. And... The minute we had told him why, John was 100% on board. I mean, he was like, oh, no, this is, we have to do it right by this aircraft's history. So then we contacted Tom Hudner, uh, the third, this is Tom's son, and we said, would you be willing to check your, do you have your dad's logbook? And he said he did. And, you know, because I'm a big believer, and if you tell someone you have Babe Ruth's bat, you better be able to show that you have Babe Ruth's <laughs> bat, you know. And... um so we talked to Tom and we said, would you mind looking through it for this bureau number? And he comes back and he says, here it is. So it's in our logbook. It's in his logbook. Uh, Marty Good's uh, logbook 
confirms our aircraft as well. So uh, we were able to back up, you know, basically a three point connection that, yeah, this was, this is accurate. So we had the airplane uh, repainted and we also had a great opportunity to redo the exhibit in the museum. And, uh, and that's what Ben really spearheaded is uh, we kind of split off endeavors where I, I made sure the aircraft's markings were correct. Uh, John Bernstein from the National Marine Corps Museum uh, probably yeah. heard about uh, friend, text friend, messages from me daily. Yeah. Friend, friend of the show, friend of the show. Yeah, absolutely. I, I picked his brain a lot through this process. And I felt bad because he's a dear friend, but I had just gotten done picking his brain a whole bunch of times because we had uh, just put in a Huey exhibit in our museum. Uh, so I was trying to make sure I got the, we got the Huey right. And I was like, well, Hey, don't worry. I won't have to bother you about work stuff for a while. <laughs> and then we started on this Corsair. So um, it all came together. So now we moved the Corsair back, the exhibit's done. It looks like it's sitting on the USS Leyte, but the walls are wrapped with the story of VF 32 and Jesse Brown and Tom Hudner um, we have some artifacts from Jesse's or, uh, from Tom Hudner's family. And then we knew we were going to cut the ribbon. You know, we wanted to have a good ribbon cutting, uh, something special. So the families of, uh, Jesse Brown and Tom Hudner were here and they cut the ribbon. Uh, we installed the ribbon for them to cut and with big scissors, they cut that together. Uh, and what was fun was they're still friends. They're all that, those families are are very tight and uh it was just amazing we also had marty good's uh family here and we had jesse the son of jesse's flight instructor uh came as well and he was here uh, and gave us some artifacts uh, as well so it, it was a very personal and i'm a big fan of the people stories behind the aircraft and and this one is huge mm -hmm. i mean this was just such a such a great emotional story and then to have them here to dedicate the aircraft you know we let them sit in the airplane uh and i i think everybody got pretty emotional when their turn came to go sit in it one of the most powerful things for me was seeing jesse brown's great granddaughters who are in high school right now climb up and sit in the airplane you know and and realize that this very one was flown by the men of that squadron on the left side under the canopy we have tom hudner's name but on the right side under the canopy we put jesse brown's name on there and we know that that marking was never there on this one but we thought it was a proper uh, salute to jesse and when we had the his family in there and they were getting their pictures leaning over with his name right there that that sold me that yeah we had done the right thing and uh so we're very proud of the exhibit and we're very proud of the lessons that are able to be taught from this airplane now Rather than just having like a fictitious, you know, paint scheme on it, we've got something with real history, and and we're telling a real story. That's fantastic. That's so so moving. It, that I, I'm I'm utterly, I'm sitting here pink with jealousy because that must have been the, <laughs> the, the most the most amazing thing. Because aircraft are fantastic, but they're they're inanimate until you put put somebody in it, and and that's that's where the heart comes from, and then all those connections that come out of that. It, well, you're exactly right. I, I was just in a museum uh, a few weeks ago, and they have a Huey that they uh, have on display, and it's beautiful. I mean, they did an absolutely beautiful restoration, but there's no effects. There's no personal effects in the aircraft. There's no story. It's, just, it's a beautiful restoration, but it almost feels like a static thing just sitting there where, you know... When we did our Huey, we were we were sure to put Hueys were made with cigarette light or uh, ashtrays in them, and uh, you know we have things like the, the a pack of cigarettes, of the same brand that our pilot liked to smoke, and a Zippo, and we've got a uh, an AM radio playing uh, Vietnam era music in the back, and you know we have sea rations that were the crew's favorite flavor, uh, which was uh, spaghetti with meat chunks, which. <laughs> As an Italian, I'm offended that that even exists. But, um, but you know, um, to me, that helps tell the story of the people that were sitting in those seats. And uh, so to be able to tell the people's side of the story, it's also where I think you're going to influence younger generations coming into the museum. Um, you know, yeah, they might come in and say, like, okay, cool, that's a big jet, fighter jet. But when you're able to tell the story of who flew it and their background, you know, you never know what might uh, what they might identify 
in those people and say, Hey, you know what? That's a hero that has a background similar to me. And that, that guy was like me or that woman was like me. So, um, very proud to, to have been a part of this. So the, the aircraft has been on display in its new colors for about what, six months now? Yeah. Um, uh, yep, yeah. About that. What, what's, what's been the reaction to, to people seeing it and seeing the display? It's been fantastic. Um, and I'll tell you the biggest, uh, reaction that i've seen are kids around junior high high school age because they come into this museum and suddenly they're hearing a compelling story of you know it's it's heroism you know you were you were you crash landed your good airplane to go and try and save your wingman and then when you think about the fact that your wingman the guy that he was trying to save uh was a person of color and you're talking about 1950 America, you know, that's Tom Hudner was a, uh, he was a forward thinking guy. And, mm -hmm. uh, and, and furthermore, Jesse Brown to have, you know, the, the just amazing personality to do it, you know, he, he, everything he did, he had to do better than everybody else. You know, if you think about it that way, cause there was a whole bunch of people that wanted to wash him out. Um, but then to become friends with these guys and to become such powerful friends that, his effects are still being felt today. Those families are still friends today because of Tom and Jesse. One of the gentlemen who was flying that day, who, who was in the squadron, who couldn't go down to get Jesse, the event had such a lifelong effect on him. He transitioned from fighters into rescue helicopters and finished out his career flying rescue helicopters. Wow. Uh, that's how much this, that's how much not being able to go down and save Jesse affected him. So, truly uh amazing that uh the effects that this one gentleman uh had on a squadron and on the history of naval aviation that's amazing i i, I didn't know that. It, it's it's one of these stories that for for playing geeks we've heard and we've known um and sure. yeah it, it it got fantastic coverage when 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 adam makos wrote wrote his book about it yeah. which which did very very well oh yeah and now we've got the Hollywood treatment with, to be fair, as soon as I heard it was being made into a movie, I, I started, I was worried. Sure. But then, oh, yeah. but then they cast Jonathan Majors, who I think is a superstar in the making. And you're like, okay, yeah, that's, yeah. We're, 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 we're in safe, safe grounds here. Um, yeah. Did you have anything? Did you talk to anybody on the film or? So when we actually started the exhibit, the first thing we did was we reached out to the Makos family uh, Adam and Erica and, uh, and others, they're, they're so, they're just a wonderful family. Uh, and then John, who is John Anderson, who's working on, was working on the set, um, uh, started getting us in touch with some of the families of the veterans, um, started saying like, Hey, you know, do you have, do you need artifacts from the movie? Cause we have some stuff that you could probably get after filming. For those who don't know, they used all real aircraft, uh, in the filming. So, uh, you're going to be looking at real Sky Raiders, Corsairs, MiG, uh, helicopter. They found an old Sikorsky somewhere that they used for the rescue. I mean, so yeah, we would get, we got sort of private images of uh, days where family members came out on the set. And then they donated a replica 500 pound bomb to us. Um, and the bomb, when it came here, was signed by the entire cast and crew, oh. as well as uh, some of the real veterans from VF-32 and the families. Uh, so that's on display in the exhibit. Uh, when Tom Hudner was here, he actually put on loan, uh, artifacts of his father's, like his rescue knife, aviator wings, his watch. Those are out with the Corsair as well. Oh, wow. Uh, so yeah, we've got some neat, uh, items in the exhibit. I need to get over there. <laughs> yeah. You, need, you guys need to come see us. Absolutely. There's, there's, there's so much to see and this. This is, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm yearning. I'm your <laughs> well, and I'm I'm thankful for people um, like my friends at the Naval Aviation Museum in Pensacola, Florida, uh, John at the National Museum of the Marine Corps. Who um, these were people that they're friends. Hmm. I wasn't going through proper channels. We were Facebook messaging each other, basically saying, "Where does the star go? Is this, is this far enough forward? You know, because <laughs> you know you don't want to do it wrong. Not on this one." You yeah. know, if it, if it was just another and it run of the day Mustang or Corsair and you got it wrong. Okay. That's not fun. But Hey, the next time you repaint it, no big deal. 
not not on of course they're related to these guys we had to get it right and because of them we got it right that's brilliant and you just you keep saying it. I'm, I'm i've always joked i'd never have john on to talk about helicopters but i suppose it's gonna have to happen now isn't it have him come on and talk about helicopters <laughs> absolutely yeah he knows a lot about the apache that's for sure <laughs> yeah I'll keep I'll keep pushing back, John. If you're listening, we love you. But <laughs> so, what have you guys got coming up at at, uh, at EAA? I, I guess you're you're sort of already planning for adventure again next year. But what what else have you got are. going on in the museum? Uh, well, in the museum, I think what we really want to do is fine tune a few of the exhibits we have, and uh, I think right now we are we're actually in decision mode. We're looking at what we're going to do next, and uh, uh, and that's actually kind of a fun process. We're Ben and I will sit down and, you know, think about what, what isn't there an exhibit of what, and that's one of the things we try to do is find exhibits that either we've never done here or maybe nobody's done, you know, um, what, what group of people should be called out that maybe have never gotten a chance to get that spotlight and, uh, and let's do it. Um, one of my favorite, if you've ever seen the movie, um, a league of their own, one of my favorite moments in that, uh, my favorite moments were always, of course, the, you know, there's no crying in baseball and stuff like that. <laughs> uh, when I became on the, when I came on the museum team, it changed. And for me, it was the ending when they all go to the hall of fame and they see the exhibit with all of them in there, because as a museum professional, you're like, wow, this is, this is what we're doing. This is what it means to these people who get featured in exhibits when they get to come and see themselves or their, their legacy uh, with their kids and grandkids. Um, so it's taken on a different meaning, uh, yeah. for me. So, so it's fun to get, it's fun to get to tell the story about people who maybe never had that chance before. And, uh, and I think that's what we're looking at. Fantastic. Chris, this has been wonderful. Thank you so much for sneaking out of your day job to spend some time with us here. Hey, absolutely. My pleasure. Anytime. Happy to do it. When we visit museums and see aircraft that have been stunningly restored or in the process of being restored, it is the stories of the men and women who flew, maintained, and delivered them that make them as interesting as they are. The work that Chris and the team at EAA have done to restore Tom Hudner Jr.'s Corsair is fantastic. That they were able to share the unveiling with the families of Jesse Brown and Tom Hudner Jr. is just even more incredible. And the images that they've been able to share with us just show that the, the love and the passion that went into it paid off to see the faces of the family. It also means my dream to get out to Oshkosh is, is burning even more brightly in my heart, not only just to meet Chris, but to see all the stuff that they've been doing. In the description below, I've put the links to EAA, their museum, all the things that they've got going on. There's even a link to the trailer for the movie, which I'm really excited about. I think it looks really special and it's gonna be great to see this story on the big screen as always if you can like subscribe give us a review especially because that helps so much with the algorithms but tell your friends and even if you want to join us on patreon we've got discord channels where we can chat and it all starts from just three pounds a month plus fat so until next time thank you so much for listening and do take care of yourselves the Damcasters is hosted and produced by Matt Bone, and it is a Boney Abroad's podcast production. To check out our other podcasts, head to boneyabroad.com.